Welcome back here to chapter 10, part 2 of our lecture on this chapter. Earlier we talked about electrons and where they're found in the atom. Now we're going to talk about its electron configuration here in part 2 of this chapter. Let's get right into it. Off we go. Part 2 of chapter 10 starts now. Okay, uh, welcome back here. Part 2 of chapter 10. Uh, in the first part, we talked about electrons and electrons transitioning from one energy level to the next. Remember that they gain and lose energy in what is referred to as a quantized matter, uh, which means that they will gain or lose enough energy to fully transition from one energy level to the next. Uh, remember, as they transition from energy levels, either lower energy to higher energy or higher energy to lower energy, uh, there's a certain amount of energy that's either absorbed uh, as they go from lower energy to higher energy are emitted as they go from higher energy to lower energy. Uh, that energy is oftentimes given off in the form of a photon of light, uh, which has a specific wavelength. And that is how energy is sort of transmitted through space is through uh, these sort of photons and electromagnetic radiation. Uh, remember that there is a relationship in terms of the wavelength of that energy our photon coming off to is energy. Uh, if it has a longer wavelength, it typically will have a lower frequency and lower in energy. If it has a shorter wavelength, it typically will have a higher frequency and be higher in energy. Uh, so that electromagnetic spectrum, you know, we had radio waves, microwaves, uh, infrared, visible part of the spectrum where we see color, uh, UV, gamma, x-rays, uh, as these electrons are transitioning, they may give off energy in the form of a wave that corresponds to one of those specific wavelengths. As we talked about last time, remember that it may not always be part of the visible spectrum that's sort of being given off. So you may not always see color, uh, but maybe it may feel heat, might be the infrared section, uh, maybe something in the UV type section coming off uh, along the way. Um, Remember that the idea of the Bohr's model of the atom, our theory of the hydrogen atom, for example, uh, corresponds to the idea of the planetary model, where we find electrons traveling these nice pretty orbits around the nucleus. Uh, remember that uh, the idea of quantized energy is uh, that they will gain or lose enough energy to completely transfer from one energy level to the next. They will never sort of find themselves again in the middle of energy levels or anything like that. Uh, again, that was sort of the staircase example that we were talking about. Uh, you're either on one step or you're on another step. You'll never be between steps or anything like that. So you have enough energy to travel a full step up or down. Kind of the same idea as electrons are transferring. They will gain this sort of quantized amount of energy. Uh, we actually did some calculations uh, to figure out some energy associated with a wave. Uh, but it will gain enough energy to fully transfer from one energy level to the next. Now, as time went on, Bohr's model of the atom really uh, described nicely what we saw in terms of the hydrogen atom and those line spectrums. And again, those line spectrums are a result of that quantized energy uh, because they can only transition from one energy level to the next. We get these very distinct line spectrum like we saw with hydrogen, uh, very individual lines. When you look at like through a spectroscope of the prism, uh, you see these lines at specific wavelengths that correspond to specific colors, for example, in the visible part of the spectrum. Those are so unique as we talked about that you can uh, really identify an unknown element simply by what lines you see at what wavelength and what colors that you actually see. That's different than something like the sun, for example, uh, gives off more of a continuous spectrum where all wavelengths basically are coming out at once. Uh, and that was sort of the example we talked about instead of maybe going through stairs, like in a quantized sort of fashion, uh, you could think of it as like walking up a ramp. On a ramp, you can pretty much stop anywhere you want. You can hit any part of that ramp. Uh, but again, on stairs, you got to either be on one step or the next, which is sort of that quantized uh, version of energy. So as it went through, we sort of moved away from Bohr's model of the atom to this sort of more quantum mechanical uh, version of the atom where through a lot of things like uh, de Broglie, uh, Heisenberg, and Schrodinger came up with really the idea that 
electrons really don't travel in these really pretty circles and these nice pretty orbits and an electron or a particle like an electron as heisenberg said uh, the more that you know about how it's traveling uh, the less you know about actually where its position actually is and vice versa again the more you know about sort of the position of a particle like an electron the less you know about how it's traveling so we moved away from the idea of orbits and electrons going in these nice pretty circles to the idea that the best that we could come up with like schrodinger said uh was these sort of probabilities are a high probability of finding electrons in a particular location within the atom we know as we talked about that there should be a pretty high probability near the nucleus as there's the electrostatic attraction between the two positive and negative attraction um, between the negatively charged electron and the positively charged nucleus because they have protons in there which are positively charged um, and so we also moved away from the idea of orbits as to where we find electrons to the idea of atomic orbitals and atomic orbitals are what we kind of see here there are s p d and f orbitals remember that any individual orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons so maximum two electrons for any individual orbital there's also the idea as we talked about of shells levels subshells and sublevels uh, so remember that the s orbitals there are only one type and that means that the maximum number of electrons it could hold is two for the p orbitals there's three different types of p orbitals as we talked about the px the py the pz orbital each of them are on a different axis in three-dimensional space since there are three individual p orbitals uh each one could hold two if you filled up the entire subshell of a p orbital like the 2p subshell which would again encompass all three of those p orbitals like the px the py and the pz orbital uh, that again is a subshell or sub level uh, you would fill them all up at, with six electrons d orbitals there are actually five different types of d orbitals and again, since each d orbital could hold two electrons, five times two is 10. If you max out the d subshell, which would be something like this, all of those individual d orbitals together, you could put two, four, six, eight, and 10 electrons in there if you filled it up uh, completely. Lastly, there are f orbitals, and there are seven f orbitals. Once again, if you complete all seven of them, that is going to be 14 in the F subshell. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I squeeze it in. Uh, all seven of those individual ones, again, would be the F subshell or sub level, subshell, and subshell. And again, if you fill it up to four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 electrons, if you completely fill them up. Remember as well that N is the principal quantum number. That is basically the energy level. And on the first energy level, that is where we see S orbitals start. It's not until the second energy level that P orbitals begin. It's not until the third energy level that D orbitals begin. And it's not until the fourth energy level that we actually see uh, F orbitals begin. Uh, so that's also really important to remember. Remember that if you have a shell or a level, depending on your book, uh, that is all the orbitals on a particularly particular energy level. So if we did the N equals two level, we would have a two S orbital and we would have our two P subshell. If we we're talking about how many electrons on the entire shell, our level it would be all those individual orbitals with a two basically in front of it are on the second energy level and that would give us two four six eight electrons if we completely fill that level 
All right, so now that we have an idea where these electrons are going to be found, and by the way, S's, P's, D's, F's, they're essentially probability maps. And again, uh, we don't know exactly where they are, but where high probability would be uh, to find these electrons would be near the nucleus. Again, not sure how they're traveling, where they're exactly located. Now, what we look here in terms of the energy before I scribbled all over the page here, uh, what we see is with hydrogen, all of the orbitals are basically equal in energy. And what I mean by that is, let me actually just erase everything I just put on there so we can kind of see. What I mean by that is all the orbitals, for example, on the n equals one, there's only one is on the same energy level. All the ones on the n equals two, they're all equal in energy. Everybody on the n equals three is also equal in terms of energy. Everybody on N equals four is also exactly equal in energy. And this is what happens with hydrogen. But as we start to get to atoms and elements that have more than one electron, when we get multiple electrons around, that's electron and electrons, which are negatively charged, those things, they kind of don't want to be near each other. So they're going to try to move around a little bit. We actually see some differences in the orbitals in terms of their energy level. So if you look at the screen right now, this is hydrogen and what happens when we get lots of electrons involved, there are more than one electron involved. You can see the switch in the energies. I'll go back so you can kind of see they're equal. And now this is the switch. And this is really important because how electrons basically fill up the atom is that they fill up the atom, you know, by going to the lowest energy level first and then to the next lowest and then to the next lowest. So for example, here, if we were to fill in our electrons, uh, they would start here at the lowest energy and go one and two. They would then come here and start filling. They would go here and start filling, which is the next lowest. This is the next lowest. And the order here is kind of how you would probably imagine it would be as it's filling. The main difference though is right around here, for example, as we go from 1s to 2s to 2p to 3s to 3p, we actually will go to the 4s next as it's lower in energy. And then we'll actually go up here to the 3d. And that also follows what we see is the s orbitals actually end up being lower in energy than the d orbitals and that affects how the electrons go into the atom uh, and it always again feels lowest energy to highest so there is an order at which you could do it and this is the order at which the electrons go in and if you know this and you know what we talked about before that basically if you have an s orbital you can max it out with two electrons if you fill up a P subshell on any level where it's available, six electrons. If you fill up the D subshell wherever it's available, you can max out with 10 electrons. And if you fill up the F uh, sub level on any level it's available, that is 14 electrons. So if you know this and you know this order here, you can actually write any electron configuration that you would need to do. We always start up here. So whenever you're doing a write it, you always start there. And basically we follow the arrow. When we get to the end, we come back. And we get to the end, we come back. And if you follow this order, as you can see, you get to the 3P and there is the 4S, right? And then we come back to the 3D and again down to the 5S and back to the 4D. So this is something that you should know. Uh, it is also something that you can recreate for yourself on the piece of paper. If you're doing a quiz or an exam on this, uh, you could recreate this for yourself relatively easily. And really all you have to remember is what we talked about in terms of where does each of these orbitals begin? On what energy level? Again, on the first energy level here, second energy level, third energy level, and fourth energy level. So knowing that S's begin on the first energy level, 
you write one S. Then down to the right of that, you know, P start on the second energy level, you write two P. Down to the right of that, you write three D as that's where the D orbitals begin. Down to the right of that, you write four F. So that's our one, two, three, four, which is where all these guys start. And at that point, all you have to do is pretty much just fill in numbers underneath it. So you go uh, 2s, 3s, uh, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. Then you go 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, 7p, 3d, 4d, 5d, 6d, 4f, 5f and now you basically recreated what you need here uh, you could add in your arrows remembering to always start up here so you again go this way this way this way this way and so forth as you go across so that is how you can kind of recreate it for yourself really quickly on the paper you basically just remember these guys one, two, three, four, and then just fill in the numbers underneath. Honestly, if you can't remember, you should maybe stop here or there and you put extra numbers underneath there. Uh, odds are you're not gonna get there anyways. In terms of electron configuration, you're going to write, so you'll still be okay even if you're at like a 70 or a 6F or something like that. Uh, there won't really be anything that you will mess up on even if you put extra numbers on the bottom. So if you remember those four as start, you can recreate this order at which electrons go into the atom uh, by yourself. And once again, if you know how to recreate this and you know how many electrons everybody could hold, uh, you really should be able to write any electron configuration that you need to do. Here again is our number of subshells and sub levels here. And once again, this is sort of what we just did sort of upside down. First energy level on either uh, 1s, second, third, and fourth. And that again is where we start to see our Fs, our Ds on the third, and our Ss there on our second. Um, <clears throat> so you could think as the energy levels that n number n equals one, n equals two, and so forth, as which is the principal quantum number. Uh, you could think of it obviously as the energy level. You could think of it almost like uh, like floors in a hotel is sort of the different floors where things are on. It just so happens in this case, on the very first floor, there's only one room, and that's an S room. And within that room, there's enough room for two people to basically stay. If you go to the second floor, or the N equals two level, there happens to be two rooms you could choose from, an S room and a P room. And in the S room, you could hold two people. In the P room, there's three bedrooms, uh, and you could hold them you know, six total people. And you go to the third floor or the N equals three level there. Uh, there's three rooms to choose from. And again, each of these rooms have uh, um, space for a certain amount of electrons. So let's talk about writing electron configuration and how to do it properly. Uh, electron configuration tells us how the electrons are distributed uh, in the atom. And once again, electrons enter the atom lowest energy level first and continue upwards, filling the lowest energy level along the way. Now, remember that if it is a neutral atom, it is equal to its atomic number, which is Z. And that is the number that we see up on top, right? Which is our atomic number. And that atomic number really is the number of protons but because if it is neutral, it will also tell us once again, the number of electrons because it equals zero. So the atomic number in a neutral case will also tell us our number of electrons. All right, so let's take a look at electron configuration. We go to hydrogen and it is number one up there on the periodic table. And again, when we look at hydrogen, that means we have one proton and we should also have one electron. So once again, we're going to start with our little table here. And let me rewrite it here just to have it. Now we can come back to this one all the time. Uh, so we have our 1s, our 2s, 3s, 4s, 
5s, 6s, 7s, and then again, P start on the second. B start on the third. And F start on the fourth. All right, so here we're gonna start with our electron configuration. Once again, we always start up here and we follow the arrows. So we're gonna come right about there. And that means that our electron configuration here for hydrogen would be 1s1. And that is how you say it. And that is how you write it. The first run one there represents the principal quantum number. That again is the energy level. So that is telling us we are on the first energy level. That is telling us in a S orbital on the first energy level, uh, we have one electron. And that is what the top one is for. That is how you should write it as one lowercase s and superscript one. You should not write anything like one s one, uh, one dash s dash one, one comma s comma one, any weird things that people want to do. Uh, this is the proper way to write the electron configuration. Uh, again, the top number there tells you how many electrons are in an orbital are a subshell. We also can represent electron configuration, which is referred to as orbital diagram. An orbital diagram uses either boxes or lines and to represent the orbitals. And it also uses arrows to represent the electrons that are there. So for hydrogen, we would need one box or one line, and that would represent our 1s orbital. And in that 1s orbital, we have one electron, and we represent that with an arrow. And the electron that goes into the orbital first is always pointing in the upwards direction. So whenever you put the first electron into that box, our line, we always represent it with it going upwards. This is what is sometimes referred to as a spin quantum number of plus one half, sort of a positive spin going in the upwards direction. And that's always how the first electron goes into the box. So up on top here, 1s1, electron configuration, orbital diagram here, which are boxes and arrows. Let's then go to the next one. And the next one is helium which will actually have two electrons but if we think about where we are at right this point uh, after hydrogen in our 1s orbital we only could hold two electrons maximum in here that means we have basically room for one more electron and there could be two ways perhaps that we could put this electron in and it looks like this so one way we could put the electron in is to put it in the exact same way, just like that. The other way is we can kind of go in the opposite direction. Now there is a rule that helps us determine which way we should do it. And that is what is referred to as the Pauli exclusion rule. The Pauli exclusion rule says that no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. So, a little bit outside of the range of our course. And when you go on to the next class, you will actually learn more about this. But as I mentioned, I think a couple of times here so far, there are actually four what are referred to as quantum numbers. And the four quantum numbers are N, uh, there's L, there's M sub L, and there's M sub S. So basically N is the energy level. Basically L represents the type of orbital the electron is in. M sub L is the orientation of those electro of those orbitals in three dimensional space, kind of like the PX, PY and PZ orbital. It also tells you how many there are. And S is really the spin quantum number for the electrons within that orbital and the electrons have their own sort of spin and affected by electrical field as well. And when we talk about electrons, electrons can basically have two types of spin. Uh, they can have a spin that's upward, like I just mentioned a second ago, 
uh, and that's going to be plus one half referred to. They could also have a spin that points downward, and that is referred to as minus one half in terms of spin. So again, a little bit outside of our class here, but I'm just going to kind of show you what it sort of means in terms of Pauli's exclusion rule here. If you were to assign the four quantum numbers for this particular electron, that first arrow in the box, the end value here would actually be one. And that's what that means. It's on the first energy level. The L value actually goes from zero to N minus one. So in this case, one minus one is zero. And a zero for an L value actually represents an S orbital. And that's basically the orbital that's it. There's only one type of S orbital and it has an M sub L value of zero. And in this case, the M sub S which is our spin of the electron would be plus one half. So these are technically what are considered the four quantum numbers for this arrow or electron in the orbital here. Now, if I put the second electron, like I have it there, pointing in exactly the same direction, it's gonna have exactly the same four quantum numbers, which means that is a big violation of Pauli's exclusion rule. You can't have that. So how do we get around it? We actually need to put the second electron that goes into the box in the opposite direction. So we cannot have it pointing in the same direction. So how does that make us have different numbers? So this first electron is obviously going to end up with the exact same four quantum numbers, just like it was over here. But when we go to this electron, the N value is still one. The L value is still zero because it's an S orbital. The M sub L is still zero, but the difference here is this electron is pointing downward, which means its spin is actually minus one half. And that difference in how the electrons are put into the orbital and the spin that they possess means that that is a minus a half this guy is plus a half. That means that they do not share all four of the same quantum numbers, and it does not violate Pauli's exclusion rule. So the take home message for us, and again, we're not going to go into great detail on this. You will, when you again, continue on to the next course, I'll talk a lot more about it. But the take home message is when you're drawing something like orbital diagrams and how electrons two electrons sharing the same orbital, which is the maximum number of electrons you can put into the same orbital. Always the first electron that goes into the box will go upwards in that plus one half spin. And the second one will go in the opposite direction. So this is what happens when we actually get to helium, which is our next guy. And helium has two electrons. So once again, if we were going to do helium, we're going to start back up here and we will come here and it will be one S two because this guy could hold two and that is what we should end up for helium. So we have one S two. Once again, the first number is the energy level or the principal quantum number. So that's again, telling us we're on the first energy level and we are again in an S orbital. And we actually now have two electrons that are in that S orbital. If we were to draw our orbital diagram, we would still need one box to represent our one S orbital. And once again, uh, the first electron would go in upwards. The second electron would go in downward. Again, not to violate Pauli's exclusion rule. And when we have these electrons going in opposite directions in an orbital, that is said that they're spins are paired. They kind of cancel each other out. So positive half minus a half equals zero. They sort of cancel each other out. And that is what is known as paired spin. Two electrons heading in opposite directions in an orbital. Continuing on to our next one, which is lithium. Uh, so if we take a look at our little chart, 1s, 2p, 3d, one s 2 p 3 d 4 f 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 3p, 
four p i don't think that's enough for what we need so far so starting up here we're going to come here and that's going to be one s two that is going to be full at that point so now we're going to come here to our two s is where we need to go and now we will end up with an electron configuration of one s two two s one once again uh, we have on the first energy level, the S orbital, it has two electrons in it. On the second energy level, we have an electron in a S orbital as well. So in this case, we have two electrons on a lower energy level, the first energy level, and now we have two electron or one electron in the second energy level. If we were, to, again, that is how you write it, 1s2, 2s1. Again, no dashes, no commas, nothing like that. That is exactly how you write it. If we were to draw our orbital diagram for this, we would need two boxes or two lines. In normal cases, if you were going to draw it based on energy, uh, you would actually kind of draw the boxes upward. Uh, but just to save space, I'm just going to draw them next to each other, regardless of energy. And how the electrons will go in here, again, following Pauli's exclusion rule, it is going to feel like we would expect. First electron going into the 1s, next electron going into the 1s, and again, pairing themselves off. And now the first electron into our next orbital will go in the upper direction. We could see at this point that we do have room here for one more electron before we need to come back and move on to the next orbital. So let's fill in that guy. And that happens with beryllium on the periodic table, which is number four, gives us a configuration of 1s2, 2s2. Again, we have two electrons on the first energy level. We have two electrons on the second energy level. Again, the number of electrons are the superscript number up there up on top. In this case, we will still need our two boxes to represent each of our orbitals. Again, the electrons would fill in here for our orbital diagram. First electron up, second electron down, first electron in the next orbital up. And now to follow Pauli's exclusion rule, we need to pair off that second electron there. At this point, you could hopefully see that there is no more room in the S orbital. So if we were just, again, kind of filling in the front part of our little table here. Um, let's see here. 3B, 4P, 3D, that's enough. So we come through here and filled. We then come back through here and filled. That means now... Any electrons that come after that will end up in the 2p orbital or 2p subshell. So let's get into that guy. And that happens at boron. Boron is number five. And again, just looking at the beginning of what we were just looking at. Obviously, we're going to come through here. 1s2. Come through here. 2s2. And now we should land on 2p here at the end. So our configuration will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. At this point, we have two electrons on the first energy level. How many electrons do I have on the second energy level? Take a moment. I'm hoping you're holding up to the screen. Three. And we have two electrons here, which is on the second energy level. And we have one electron there that's on the second energy level. So we actually have three electrons on the second energy level. For our orbital diagram here, we'll need a few extra boxes. And that's because we now have the 2p subshell here. And remember that there are three different p orbitals. And each of these boxes, or if you did lines, represents a different p orbital. That's the px, that's the py, and the pz orbital. Uh, and obviously here we would feel like we did before. One up, one down, s is filled. One up, one down, s is filled. The very first electron here that will go into this subshell for p will actually go into the px orbital, the far left one. And it also will go in the upwards direction. So now when we look at it here.
just drawing the first part here. We went through here, filled. We went through here, filled. We're at this point. We now have room, if you look here, at for five more electrons, right? Before that 2P subshell is actually filled. So where are we going to put these electrons that come in next? So we do have a few options as to where we could put the next electron. Uh, we obviously could put it in the same box and we should go opposite, right? Because that's Pauli's exclusion rule. We can't put it in the same box in the same direction. Uh, other option would be we could go up and up and go that way before we start to put them in the same box. So what is the way that we should put these electrons in as we continue on? Of course, there is another rule that helps us decide, and that is our friend Hun's rule. And Hun's rule essentially says the most stable arrangement for electrons in a subshell is one where the greatest number of parallel spins. So remember that what we saw before, for example, here, if this is our P, H2P, this, if we were putting it in the same box, is paired spins. If I went like this and put it in the one next to it, this is what is known as parallel spins. And that is what Hun's rule tells us we should do. So we should not do that. So when you come across subshells that have multiple orbitals and you're filling electrons in it, and that would be your P, right? That has three. That would be your D. That has five. That would be your F subshells that have seven and seven. We always feel basically one at a time and that maximizes the parallel spin and once we run out of orbitals where we put one electron in then we will go back and start pairing them off so that is how we fill p subshells one at a time and then come back and fill that's how we do d subshells as well one at a time and then come back and fill And same thing with our friend, the F subshell, one at a time, and then come back and pair off. So Hun's rule basically says that will maximize stability and parallel spins what you want. So P, D, and F subshells, we always feel electrons going upwards all the way across, starting left to right when you're drawing the orbital diagram and then come back left to right and pair everybody off. All right, so that obviously happens here is our friend carbon, which is six. And once again, here, our electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. We have two electrons on the first energy level, and we have four electrons here on the second energy level. Looking at our orbital diagram here, once again, we need our three boxes there for our p. We're going to put our first electron in up, down, up, down. Once again, up and to obey Hun's rule, maximize parallel spin. We'll put the next electron in the center box, which represents really the PY orbital. So really what we're doing is we're filling these individual P orbitals up first with one electron, and then we're coming back and we're going to top them off. All right, continuing on here, we're almost at the first 10. Might as well hit the first 10. So let's go to seven, which is nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen has seven protons, which is its atomic number and Z. Also should have seven uh, electrons here if it is neutral. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p3 is our electron configuration. You could always count the top numbers to figure out how many electrons you've used. That is two and two is four and three is seven. We have five on the second energy level and we have two on the first energy level. And here, our orbital diagram gonna look very similar, except we're gonna add another electron in there. Up, down, up, 
down, up, up, and once again, Hun's rule, maximizing parallel span, we're gonna go upwards. You should also recognize at this point, we have room for one, two, and three more electrons before our P sub shell is filled. So let's take a look at those eight oxygen, eight electrons continuing to fill our 2P subshell at this point. 1S2, 2S2, 2P4. So now we have six electrons on the second energy level. And again, those six electrons come two and four, two still on the first energy level. And remember that the front numbers represent the energy levels. So that's the first energy level, N equals one, N equals two for each of those guys. Filling in our overload diagram here, gonna be the same overall overload diagram, but gonna put in our electrons. So up and down, up and down, up, up, up. And now we're gonna come back and pair off that PX orbital in this case. Okay, uh, so again, uh, we're gonna put that last one as we come back to pair them back up uh, into that first PX orbital again. We maximize the parallel spin, and now we're gonna come back and pair it off. So we still obviously have at this point, uh, two more spots that we could fill up before this subshell that can hold a maximum of six electrons will be full. So let's just finish out the first 10 here. Uh, fluorine, which is number nine, has nine electrons to go with those nine protons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. Once again, putting our next electron right there in our P subshell. Looking at our orbital diagram, up, down, up, down, up, up, up. Again, we put our last one there in our PX orbital. And now we're gonna come to our middle one and pair it up that one and fill that one in. As you can see now, we are down to one more electron that we could fill in there. And that's going to happen there with neon, which is number 10. That has 10 protons. And again, this is our atomic number from the periodic table, uh, which tells me that is 10 protons. And again, if it's neutral, which we're assuming in this case, that is how we are getting to our 10 electrons. So filling it in, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Again, next electron that we put in there right now ended up there in our P subshell, filling in our orbital diagram up and down, up and down. Again, one at a time in the upwards position, that positive half a spin coming back now, pairing off, pairing off. And now in the case of our P subshell, last one heading into the PZ, kind of looks like a two, but a Z. Uh, orbital right there at this point as we can see uh we are filled in terms of that orbital uh so i'm just going to partially make that little list in that order that we were using here so we've obviously went this way and filled we went this way and filled we went this way now and filled it so the next spot that we would hit would be the 3s orbital as we go through uh, and again, obviously you would then come back and continue that pattern. Let's take a look at argon. So why don't you take a moment and write the electron configuration for argon. Starting here with our little guy I just made here, 1s2. So that is 1s2. Coming this way, 2s2. Coming this way, 2P6. You could also count the top. 6, 2, and 2 is 10. Got to keep going. 3S2. That's 12. Got to keep going. Coming back. 3P6 in this case. That is 18. So that is where we should end up at that point. So we got 3S2, 3P6. Again, counting the top numbers will give us our electrons. If we were to do our overload diagram, once again here, we would need a bunch of boxes or lines. I'm not gonna draw this in terms of energy. I'm just gonna go uh, left to right here to conserve space on the screen. Uh, but they would feel like we've been doing. So one up, one down, one up, one down, one up, one down, one up. And now pairing it off. So just to rephrase there. 
and it would feel like normal. Uh, one up, one down, one up, one down. Here and go one at a time as a subshell, and then come back and pair it off. One up, one down, one up, up, and up. Again, a multiple orbital subshell, then coming back and pairing at that point. Now, the off-ball principle is the idea that uh, protons are filled in to the atom, basically one at a time into the nucleus, and elements are also added to the atom that way, one at a time in a build-up principle. Uh, we see that with our atomic number, right, as it goes from left to right on the periodic table. Uh, you know, it increases, right? It just it goes from one to the next, and it builds up. So let's take a look at potassium here. If we were to write the electron configuration again, following our sort of uh, pattern there, we would end up with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Now, when we look at potassium's electron configuration and we actually look at it all the way through to here, That is, if we count the top numbers, that is 2, 4, 10, 12, 18 electrons. If we go to the periodic table and look at number 18, that is going to be our friend argon. And we can actually shortcut this uh, configuration by using argon's configuration. And we could put argon in these sort of brackets, which means the electron configuration for argon, and then we can continue on with it. This is sometimes referred to as the argon core, and in practice, we use the noble gases. So that is group eight on our periodic table. So we go through our group eight. We go to group eight, we have, you know, helium, neon, argon, all the ons, right? We got our krypton and our xenon and so forth. So you can kind of shortcut your electron configuration by going to the noble gas that comes right before whatever you may be writing for. So for example, if we looked at sodium, which is 11, uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. If we look at sodium's electron configuration up to here, that is two, four, and six make 10, counting the top numbers here. And 10 on the periodic table there is our friend neon. So we can use this sort of shorthand by putting neon in brackets and again, continuing on with this configuration. Uh, if we looked at, say, calcium. Calcium is actually 20 electrons. Uh, that would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Once again, if we look at this part of its configuration, right to about there, uh, that is if we count the top in terms of electrons, uh, that once again is 18. That is 2, 4, 10, 12, 18. 18 on the periodic table, still our friend argon. So we could shortcut this by argon 4s2 as its electron configuration. So sometimes this shorthand is used. It should always be a noble gas that goes into the brackets. And then you just continue on with the rest of uh, the configuration. Now let's talk a little about electron configuration for transition metals. Uh, transition metals have incompletely filled D subshells or give rise to cations that have incompletely D subshells. There's actually two exceptions to the normal electron configuration and they actually happen in chromium and copper. Uh, chromium is 24 electrons, which is chromium. And if you follow our chart there and just follow it zigzagging back and forth, you will end up with an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d4. It has been found experimentally that the 
chromium is more stable with one extra electron in its d orbital one less electron in its s orbital and they're actually able to do that because the 4s orbitals and the 3d orbitals they're really close in terms of energy so it doesn't take a lot for that electron to sort of go up into the d orbital and that is where the difference is and that is what you can see down there. So the correct configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, and 3d5. It essentially fills in all the d orbitals with one electron, gives it sort of maximal parallel spin. Uh, copper, which is 29, basically follows the exact same rule it has that extra electron and i'm going to use argon to represent uh, this part of the configuration and it will have 4s1 3d10 and that is different than you would get if you sort of went back and forth and you would end up with 4s2 3d9 for example so those two exception exceptions of if you look on the periodic table chromium at 24 and copper at 29 uh those are the two in the first row transition metals that you are responsible to know the exceptions i will tell you as you continue on and probably in your next class you might need to know more but if you look on the periodic table and kind of look down where those two are located and actually kind of come in as well uh things like silver and palladium and those guys uh there's a lot more exceptions to how the electrons are configured uh, than you would get with your normal sort of back and forth. So for our class, we're going to pretend that it is just chromium and copper, the only exceptions. Uh, but the real life answer is there's a lot more exceptions right underneath there in that transition metal region. Um, but you will not be responsible for those in this class. Uh, you will be responsible to know chromium and copper's correct electron configuration, which again is one more electron in the D orbital, one less electron in the S orbital. All the other ones, including silver and all those other guys that are technical on the periodic table in this region, which also are exceptions uh, for our class. You don't have to worry about that. You can just write it based on the chart and uh, write the electron configuration. The lanthanide series are those guys on the two rows on the bottom of the periodic table. And that's where our Fs begin. And they have completely filled F subshells are incompletely filled uh, for F subshells as well. Now, obviously, groups on the periodic table um, show very similar um, larities in their valence electrons and their chemical properties. So what are valence electrons? Valence electrons are the highest energy electrons. So for example, if we looked at nitrogen, uh, that's seven, one S2, uh, two S2, two P3. Once again, nitrogen has uh, two electrons on the first energy level. It has five electrons on the second energy level, which is the highest energy level. Those five electrons are the valence electrons. These lower energy electrons are sometimes referred to as core electrons. Uh, same thing if you looked at lithium, which is three, one S2, two S1. This is one electron appears on the second energy level. That would be the valence electrons. This one is the core electrons. Why is that important? It's going to be really important in the next chapter. And that is because valence electrons are the ones that are involved in bonding. Uh, they are the outermost electrons, they're the highest energy electrons, and they are the ones that, because they're furthest away from the nucleus, are not held as tightly, and they're the ones that are involved in bonding. Core electrons are there, but they are not involved in bonding. And that's what we could see on this uh, sort of table here, the valence electrons. So you could definitely write electron configuration to figure out valence electrons. Are the valence electrons will equal the group number? So let me see if I can hear this uh, periodic table a little bigger, maybe. Let's take a look at 
the next one here. Uh, so example here, group seven contains uh, S orbitals that are gonna have two and five in the P subshell. Remember our group numbers go across. Um, it's a big, bigger shot here of our periodic table. Remember group numbers, right? So this is our one, A, two, all the way across. We could also use sort of the just numbering all the way across of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So in terms of our representative numbering, uh, a group numbers, which is group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven, and group eight, which is our A numbering, the group number will equal the number of valence electrons. So here in group one, we can see they all have one. Everybody in group two has two. Everybody in group three here has three. Every group four has four, five, six, seven, and eight. One exception to our sort of A numbering is helium. Helium only has two electrons, two valence electrons, because frankly, it only has two electrons total. So that's why it only has two, even though it's part of group eight. Now we could just number all the way across one through 18, as you can see here. And in terms of our, just erase some of this here so we can see. If we were to use just one through 18, starting from left to right in terms of our groups, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, 16, 17, and 18. We could actually use that numbering for the transition metals. So remember just a review of what we talked about in terms of the periodic table. Uh, we have uh, our alkali metals here, right? This is our alkaline earth metals this is our halogens and our noble gases right our group eight from here to here right is our transition metals and when we're looking at transition metals in terms of valence electrons you know, sometimes it varies by uh, a person, but we can use just a straight numbering here of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. And as you can see here, that is a S two D one. That's three. S two D two, which is four. Uh, S two D uh, three which is five and so forth. Even with our exception here, that's a S1 D5, which is six and seven. And you can see that obviously as you go down here, as I was also mentioning before, I think you can kind of see it right here. Uh, the PD, for example, also another exception. There's no electrons in the S and there's actually all 10 electrons there in the D. Over here, silver, also one electron in the S and an extra electron in the D. So as I was mentioning before, uh, in terms of valence electrons, you could also just use regular numbering from left to right to figure out how many valence electrons your transition metals will have. Um, but uh, in terms of those exceptions to a normal electron configuration, you could see in addition to copper and chromium, which are the two you are responsible for, if you kind of go down and below these guys, uh, there's a number of exceptions sort of happening, you know, through this area. So once again, you're not going to be responsible for, um, excuse me, you're not going to be responsible for all the exceptions. You will be responsible though for in this particular class for chromium and copper's exception. So keep that in mind. So valence electrons are important in terms of bonding. They're the outermost electrons. They're the ones that are involved in bonding. You could get it by writing the electron configuration, uh, but you could also get it by the group number. Again, for representative groups, which are our A groups, and that's our normal numbering of our one, two, skip, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. The number of valence electrons equals the group number. 
I say that because in bonding and stuff, you're not going to play too much with uh, valence electrons and transition metals. You will pretty much only kind of do with those groups, the one through eight, the normal sort of one through eight, uh, which again, in terms of valence electrons, this is normally when you're doing bonding and valence electrons, these are normally the ones you need to worry about not too much happening over here in the transition metal in terms of bonding valence electrons. But if you do need to figure out valence electrons for a transition metal, that is how you do it. Just kind of normal one through 18 numbering on the periodic table groups. Obviously our periods, as we also talked about, go left to right. And there are seven periods on the periodic table. So why is that important? Well, we take a look at the periodic table. There are certain groups that are groups for electron configuration and how they fill. Group one and two on the periodic table are your S block. And if you remember, S could hold two electrons. So if you go, that's one electron, two electrons, one electron, two electrons, one electron, two electrons. Now groups three through eight is your P block. Remember, P subshell could hold a maximum of six electrons. That is one, two, three, four, five, and six. Your transition metals is your D block. And remember, D subshell could hold 10. That is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And the two rows on the bottom, which is the lanthanide and actinite series as they follow, are your F block and F could hold 14 electrons. And once again, uh, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 electrons. So what does that mean? Well, using the period number and these sort of blocks on the periodic table, if you know what you are doing, uh, you could count off electron configuration right there from the periodic table. Would I recommend doing so? I'm going to tell you um, maybe not, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. So let's just say, for example, we did our sodium, which I think uh, we looked at a second ago, which is 11, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, right? So once again, our periods on the periodic table, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? So when we look at this, we would start, if we were going to count off to sodium, we would start here and we'll start with yellow. We would start here at one and this would be one S one coming all the way over to helium would be one S two. We would then Come down here to two, this would be two S2, two boxes. We would then go to, we're still on two, two P, one, two, three, four, five, six. And now we would go to the third energy level there. Three. 3P, I'm sorry, 3S1, which would be right there. I'll go underneath it there. So you actually could count off electron configuration from the periodic table if you know what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> let me try this again. Take a look at another one here. Let's say we wanted to do sulfur, which is 16. Starting up here, this would be all the way across to there. 1s2 coming to here 2s2 right because this is one two period three period four period five period six period and seven period we would then come this way which would be 2p6 we would come here 3s2 I'm just gonna go underneath since i'm running out of room and then here we would actually just count this is 3p1 3p2 3p3 3p4 and we would have our electron configuration. So you could count it right off on the periodic table if you know what you're doing. And I say, if you know what you're doing, because there are a few places where maybe 
Um, we might run into some issues. Let's say we wanted to do, let's say we wanted to do iron, which is 26. We could still do our same thing. So we would start up here, 1s2 to there. Oh, maybe I'll write it down here, 1s2. 2s2 to there. 2p6 to neon. Again, you're just counting the boxes, basically. 3s2 right there. 3p6 all the way across. We're now at 4. 4s2. This is our D block, right? Ch -ch -ch. A reminder that as we talked about, S's begin on the first energy level. P's begin on the second energy level, which is what you see right there. D's, though, begin on the third energy level. But wait a sec, that's the fourth energy level. So this right here is actually not 4D. That is actually 3D. This guy right here would be 4D. This guy right here would be 5D. This guy right here would be 6D. So if you count it off the periodic table, electron configuration, Ds are one behind the period number. And that's an important thing to remember. If you do remember that, then you know that this would be 3D1, 3D2, 3D3, 3D4, 3D5, and 3D6. And you would have the right electron configuration, but it would not be 4D6. So it's really important to remember that. Where else does that have a problem? Fs begin on the fourth energy level. And these are our Fs down here, 4F and 5F. And that is, those guys go really uh, right over here where our lanthanide and actinide series is right here. And that is basically two behind the period number. This is really period six, but it starts at four. So there are a couple of places where if you do not know what you're doing, uh, you may find yourself running into some trouble because uh, you get the wrong number. So I personally would recommend doing it with the arrows and that chart that we used previously. You should always get the right answer that way. If you want to check yourself by trying to write it off on the periodic table, you can. Uh, but I probably won't rely upon it to do because there's a lot of places where you could make an error if you're not really, really careful. So it's really important to try to be careful and not make any type of error like that. All right. So without the periodic table, and once again, uh, we've talked about the periodic table. Let's talk about electron configuration and ions, right? So we know that we have cations, which are things that are positively charged, and that's a result of losing electrons. There's anions, which are negatively charged, which is a result of gaining electrons. And in this particular case, we do have to adjust our electron configuration. So for example, if we take, uh, we'll do sodium again. So sodium with uh, no charge has 11 electrons. That is our 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. When sodium gains a charge, as we talked about, it's actually group one, which means it will gain a plus one charge. It means it has not 11 electrons, but will actually have 10 electrons, right? Which means we do have to adjust this electron configuration to 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That is 10 electrons, which is also our friend neon. So because it lost an electron, we actually have to adjust electron configuration. Uh, let's talk about anions, which are things that gain electrons. So if we take something like oxygen, which is eight electrons. With no charge, it will have an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p, uh, do some math there, four sounds like a winner, I think. Now oxygen is group six, which means it will gain two electrons, which means it will end up at 10 electrons in the oxide ion. 
is configuration then would have to be adjusted as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That also is 10 electrons, which is Neon's configuration. As you might see here, Sodium with a plus one charge, oxide or oxygen with a negative two charge, they both have the same electron configuration as neon. So neon, sodium with a plus one charge, oxide with a minus two charge, all have the same electron configuration. Things that have the same electron configuration are what are known as being isoelectronic with each other. So things that are isoelectronic have the same electron configuration. What is happening here? Why do they all have the same electron configuration? Let's take a look at our periodic table here that we scribbled on. Let's get rid of everything we scribbled on before. There we go. Well, if we take a look at sodium here, it lost electrons and it actually backed up on the periodic table to neon. Oxygen gained electrons and it went forward on the periodic table to the noble gas that came after it. And that is what happens with representative elements when they gain and lose electrons. Metals will typically lose electrons, representative metals, and they will go backwards and end up at the same electron configuration as the noble gas that comes right before them. Nonmetals, which are things that typically will gain electrons, will gain those electrons and go forward on the periodic table to the noble gas that comes after them. Why do they do that? Noble gases are chemically inert. They are stable. And that is really the basis for what we're going to talk about, I think, in the next chapter, which is bonding. The purpose of all bonding, ionic bonding, where electrons are transferred, covalent bonding, where electrons are shared. The whole point of all bonding is for everybody to achieve the same electron configuration as a noble gas. And that's because they're really, really stable. And that's what everybody's trying to achieve by bonding. So by bonding, they're trying to achieve that really stable noble gas configuration and be just like the noble gas. So let's take a look at a couple more examples. So why don't you take a moment here and why don't you write the electron configuration for sulfide? Why don't you also write the electron configuration for, uh, we'll do strontium. So take a moment and write the electron configuration for each of those ions. Look, uh, so we'll start with sulfur, which is 16 here, right about there. And sulfur with uh, no charge is 16, which means his electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2. That is 12. And again, you get that by counting the top numbers there. Uh, 3P12, uh, 4, looks like a winner. So sulfide with minus 2 charge. Remember that the minus means it gained electrons. The 2 means it gained 2 electrons, which means sulfur will actually end up with 18 electrons. And that means it will actually be 1S2, 2S2, 2P6. 3s2 and 3p6 18 is our good friend argon yeah and what did we see sulfur picked up two electrons ended up at the same electron configuration as argon which is what we would expect to happen let's take a look at strontium here uh strontium is 38 i might regret this in just a second we'll go down here sr no charge is 38. That's going to be a 1s2. If we write out the complete configuration, 2s2, 2p6. And just to show you, we, again, we could kind of do it there. 3s2, right? Obviously, uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, uh, 3s2, 3p6, all the way to the end. Uh, 4s2, 
going all the way across here, 3D, remember, 10. Now back to 4P6. And now that is again, period one, two, three, four, and five. 5S2. Five again, count the top, 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36, 38. So again, you could count it off like that. You could follow our little uh, chart, which is probably, again, the best way to do it. Now, if we have an electron configuration here for strontium with a plus two charge, plus means it lost electrons two, it lost two means 36. Truthfully, if I just kind of take this electron configuration down to here, if I get it right about there, there we go. And those are the two electrons, which by the way, some valence electrons there. Those are the two valence electrons. Those five S two are lost. And we're left with that as the electron configuration. That is also 36, which is Krypton's configuration. So what we see with strontium is it loses electrons and backs up to Krypton, which is our noble gas here. And once again, this is really formation of an ionic compound when this would happen. And that is the basis of what's happening is everybody's trying to become like the noble gases uh, and have the same electron configuration. A really important distinction on this is, and where some people sort of mess up on when they think about this is, do these elements become, say, krypton? Do they become neon? And the answer is they do not, right? So if I have sulfide with a minus two charge, although this sulfide has 16 electrons, because it is still sulfide, it has, I'm sorry, because it has 18 electrons in this case, because it is sulfide, it actually will still have seven, 16 protons. I'll get that whole numbering right. Give me a second here. So because of the minus two charge, it has 18 electrons. It has its 16 protons, which gives us our minus two charge. The element doesn't change from sulfur to argon, because remember, the only thing that can change what element it is, is the number of protons right that is the most important thing the atomic number determines what element you're dealing with so in the case here of sulfide it is still sulfur because it still has 16 protons it just now has a different electron arrangement that is identical to what we find with argon so it's isoelectronic with argon but sulfide does not become the element argon. It is still sulfur because it has 16 protons, but it now will have the same electron configuration as argon. So sometimes people think because it ends up at the same electron configuration, the element changes from one element to another. It does not because really what we're talking about here is bonding and bonding only involves electrons uh, when this would occur. And because that only involves electrons and does not touch the protons or anything in the nucleus, uh, it still remains the same element. So that's a really important distinction to keep in mind. Although they may be isoelectronic, have the same electron configuration as a noble gas, they are still the same element they started out as, uh, but they've just become a lot more stable because of that electron configuration that they end up with. But they're still the same element because they still have the same number of protons. So when we do have cations or anions, we do have to adjust the charge. And what you will typically see here with representative elements, which are our elements, you know, are in our A grouping, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, and so forth. They will either gain or lose electrons enough to end up at the noble gas configuration. Now let's talk a little bit about transition metals and ions, and they are a little bit different. So transition metals are a little different in terms of when they form ions. And they're gonna form cations because they are metals, they will always form positively charged ions. So if you remember, the transition metals are the Ds. So for example, 4S 
and 3D. And when we have a transition metals, we start to actually fill the S's first, and then we actually start to fill the D's. So that was the order, right? When we were doing those arrows in our electron configuration. Now, there's kind of a weird thing that occurs when we start actually filling the D orbitals with electrons and the energy of the S orbitals. When the electrons go into the atom, when they are getting filled, they go in this order, S's first and then D's. Once you start populating some of the D orbitals, there actually becomes a switch in the energy level. And this pretty much only happens with transition metals. And what ends up happening is the 4S will actually end up being higher in energy than the 3D after it starts to be filled or after it's filled with, say, D electrons. So on the way in, S elect orbitals are lower in energy, so they get the electrons first. On the way after they're filled, the energy actually changes and the S orbitals are actually higher in energy than the D. Why is this important? This is important because when transition metals lose electrons, they actually always lose their highest energy electrons first. And that is your S's right there. They will actually lose their S electrons first. And then if necessary, they will dip into the D's. What do I mean by that? Let's take our friend iron. Iron that is neutral is 26 electrons. I'm going to uh, shorthand it here. So I'm going to do an argon 4s2 3d6. And again, that's argon's electron configuration continuing on. So let's say iron loses two electrons. It will now have 24 electrons. And what I'm going to do actually, since I have it drawn up here, is I'm going to uh, borrow this and just fill in my kind of orbital diagram for iron with no charge. Let me just kind of clean it up a little bit. I kind of made a mess over here. Get that. All right. So. Iron with no charge, if we were drawing the orbital diagram, should look something like this. Uh, we got six of those, two, four, six, and two of those. Perfect. So when iron loses two electrons, it actually has 24 electrons. So the first electrons that it will always lose is actually the S's, which are these two right here. And that's because they actually end up being higher in energy. So the correct electron configuration for iron with a plus two charge is argon 3d6. Now iron, for example, like lots of transition metals can make multiple types of charges. So iron can make a plus three charge as well. So if it has a plus three charge, it actually has 23 electrons. So how would we write the electron configuration for this guy? Well, we would start the same way. We would get rid of our two s electrons there are two four s electrons at this point we have no arrow place to go but to the d right and we will get rid of our one electron out of here that will give us an electron configuration of argon 3d5 in this case and if you remember uh before I did that there. If you remember when we we're looking at our valence electrons, I got that chart not too far back here, right here. There it goes. There is our iron right there, right? Technically in group eight, if we're looking at transition metals and valence electrons, it has two in the S and it has six more in the D, which is its eight valence electrons. So that is why we can dip into the D to get rid of them. And that will give us our 3D5. So transition metals are different. They will always, let me just erase all this on here. So, see it. so this is our transition metals through here. And remember that this is basically the S block all the way through here. 
So transition metals, uh, which again, period wise is right around here. Transition metals will always lose these guys first and then necessary dip into here. If you're some transition metal on the row below it, it will lose these guys first, then dip in these guys and then dip and so forth. So transition metals will always lose those S electrons first and then necessary, they will dip into the D to fix it. With that being said, why don't we try one here? Why don't we try a couple here just to make sure? Why don't you write the electron configuration for, let's do nickel with a plus four charge. And why don't we do MN with a plus two charge? So here's MN, 25, nickel, 28. So take a moment and see what you come up with. Again, both transition metals and make sure you adjust it accordingly. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, once again, nickel here, which is 28 with no charge. Uh, if we were doing electron configuration, uh, that's gonna be an argon. Once again, 4s2 right there. Remember that that is 3d, so 3d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Having 10, right? It's 10 right there. Valence electrons. These guys right about there. Yeah. So uh, looking at this here, plus four, plus means that it has lost electrons. And four is how many? So nickel with a plus four charge will have 24 electrons. Once again, since this is a transition metal, we are going to lose our S electrons first, which are these. And that's two. Now we need to get the other two out of our Ds. And that is gonna leave us with an electron configuration. I'll go right here for nickel with a plus four of, and I'll just do a shorthand here, argon. Again, the four S2 now is gone. And two of these guys are gone, three D6. All right, let's take a look at MN. Uh, MN with uh, no charge is 25. So once again, electron configuration for MN would be argon, which is again, the noble gas that comes right before it. And looking here, uh, 30, get rid of some of that there. All right, so argon, which is our noble gas comes right before it. Uh, once again, here, we're gonna have a 4S2 situation. And just counting it off if you want one, and again, that's 3D. So 3D1, 3D2, 3, 4, and 5. With a plus two charge, plus means the lost electrons. And two is how many, which means 23. Once again, just like before, transition metal gonna lose our DSs first. So those are gonna go away. That's only two electrons, which is actually all we need in this case. So that's going to be argon uh, 3D5. So transition metals are a little bit different. Uh, they will always lose the S's first because of that switch in energy that occurs. And then they will go into the D's if they need more electrons to be lost. They actually don't get back to a noble gas configuration because for a lot of them, they would have to lose like 12 electrons and that's probably not gonna happen. So most of them will not get to a noble gas configuration uh, like your representative metals like sodium, magnesium, calcium, potassium. When they lose electrons, aluminum, they will go back to a noble gas configuration. But here, transition metals, a little bit different in terms of how you need to handle uh, their ions and their electron configuration. All right, well, I think that should wrap it here for chapter 10, part two of our lecture. So we talked about writing proper electron configuration. We talked about drawing orbital diagrams, which are boxes and arrows. We talked about electron configuration for neutral guys. And now we just talked about electron configuration for ions, both representative ions, uh, metals and non-metals, and also transition metals, which again are a little bit different. And we also looked at the periodic table 
and how you can kind of use the periodic table to guide you through electron configuration. Remember, you do need to be really careful if you do choose to use the periodic table to do so. I again would highly recommend using that table that we use for a majority of electron configuration, which once again, as you can see right here, it takes literally less than a minute to recreate yourself if you needed to recreate it and use it. And if you know this, like we talked about, and also obviously how many electrons you could throw in there, uh, you should be in business and in good shape once again to write any electron configuration that you want. Again, with basically this two pieces of information, both of which uh, you can recreate really easily for yourself and also make sure you write it correctly. And there you go, six there for B. Um, you can write the electron configuration for anything that you would need. Again, remember that there are a lot of exceptions to electron configuration, but once again, for you guys, uh, chromium and copper are the two exceptions as you do need to know the proper electron configuration. With that being said, thank you for watching part two of chapter 10, electron configuration in the books, and we'll see you on the next one. I think we might have some bonding coming up next. So we'll kind of put some of this stuff to use in the next chapter as well. Have a good day, night, evening, morning, whenever you're watching this, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Hello there, and welcome to the end of another lecture. I leave you with this thought. What do you call iron blowing in the breeze? Febreze. <laughs>